Hi, everyone. So over the past two days, um, a number of times the 100K was brought up. Does everyone know what the 100K is now? Or who doesn't know? OK. So there are a few people. Um, so the 100K is a student-led competition. There are actually three individual contests throughout the year. We actually had our first one in November called Pitch. We're actually having our second one on February 10th called Accelerate. And our last one, Launch, will be on May 13th. Yeah. Sure. So the 100K uh, is it's a student-led entrepreneurship competition. So we source students. And the only requirement is that you have one MIT student on your team. So a lot of teams um, are made up of folks from Harvard, from other schools in Boston, or even schools you know, across the country. Uh, and they have like one anchor or more uh, here at MIT. And uh, so just a quick rundown. So pitch is kind of like our entry level competition where all you have to do is come with your idea and your hopes and your dreams and you can uh, pitch and win uh, or for the chance to win $5,000. Accelerate, we require you to have like a little bit more of a business plan and a model and some people have uh, a product demo or a website or you know, some, some materials to showcase, and that's, that's what will be Accelerate. So just a quick plug for that. That's on February 10th in the Media Lab. Um, you can go to our website and get tickets right now. They're free. Um, so, and it's a, it's a great event. And for folks who are, um, you know, interested in joining a venture, a lot of these, a lot of, the, like, our 30 folks that will be pitching their companies on the 10th, are very young companies. They're looking for technical co-founders or co-founders with skills. So uh, it's a great way to meet them and you can vote for your, the, the team that you like. A great, another great thing about Accelerate is it's all student, uh, or it's all audience choice is the winner. So the winner of the $10,000 grand prize for Accelerate is all chosen by the audience members. So that's you folks coming out to support your friends. Um, and so all of that is kind of lead up to our marquee event, which is called Launch. Um, and that's, the, that's where we get our name, the 100K. The winner of that will win $100,000 in non-dilutive funding for their venture. And so for that one, you can imagine you need probably a little bit more. So you need to be a little bit further along in your business plan. You have your market identified. You have maybe even some revenue. You have um, you know, a, a good amount of like a good team built out and some mentorship. Um, and then an, another good thing about Accelerate and Launch, so Accelerate applications are already closed, but you could apply next year. But for Launch, if you apply this year and you make it to the semifinal round, we pair you with industry mentors. And then also uh, we can get, put you in touch with designers or any kind of skills that you need to get your venture off the ground and ready to showcase at Launch. So just to let you know, for the Launch competition, um, Applications will be open the very beginning of March, and they will close at the very beginning. I think April 2nd or 3rd, they'll be closed. So just to keep you aware, just keep that in mind as you see a lot of emails go in and out that that's the next application that's due. Currently, um, as Christian was saying, the uh, Eventbrite for the February 10th Accelerate is open right now, so you should all sign up. Oh, also, this is a really great opportunity for all of you to meet people. So when you have that 10-minute break in between the first and second session, go talk to someone else um, that you don't know in this classroom, because I actually see many of you who have applied for the 100K in the past. So go reach out to them and go chat with them and see if they need a founder or some to, someone to wa work with them on the team. Great. Thanks, guys. Good. You're going to run the pitch? Oh, yes. And we have a pitch coming up. Awesome. Okay. So, you're gonna okay. Run it, right? so I have two pitches tonight, but I'll keep it short. Scout's honor. Um, honor compels me to tell you I was never a scout. My name is Dextina, and I am a dual master's student in the IDM program as well as mechanical engineering. And for my first pitch, I'm working on a side hustle. Um, and so I'd first like to ask you guys a question. How many of you have been um, in a pitch and seen somebody trying to present something and you have no idea what they're selling? 
There's no clue. The, maybe the slides are just a warm, wet mess. You know, things are out of place. Okay, so what I do is I help people tell and sell their story. So I create branded uh, marketing materials, so pitch decks, business cards, newsletters, etc., to help you be able to get your story across. And we've been learning that this is one of your most important assets, so let me help you package it. If you Actually, I just helped a company that I'm going to pitch next win $25,000 in a pitch competition. They won first place, not just because it's a really good idea, but also because they were able to communicate it to people well. So if you would like help with creating those materials, please reach me at dextina at mit.edu. So the second one. No, he already told, thank you. <laughs> so the second one is Zapenda. Zapenda is a fashion startup that creates custom clothing that are African inspired for the 140 million people of African descent that don't live on the continent. We've already had in just a year, $25,000 in revenue and the pitch competition that we won. Um, we make 60 to 70% margins, um, and we're able to provide this all online and create a connection between the continent and people who are interested in buying. Um, so what we're actually looking for is help with building out a website. We're refining our business model and hoping to uh, vamp up to 10K a month. Um, and yeah, so website, um, refining business model and something else, but I forgot. So you can reach me at Dextina, D-E-X-T-I-N-A, at mit.edu, and you can also follow us at Zapenda, Z-A-P-E-N-D-A, -E on Instagram. So, thank you. Any, any questions? Or? Right, so luckily we've had customers from day zero. Uh, people saw our founder in her outfit and were like, can I buy that off of you? So we've been operating completely profitable. There, you know, every, we have tailors um, and a team in Congo and we've already been doing this for the past year. So our market segment is people who are trying to reconnect and reclaim their culture. And that's who we're helping around the world. Yeah. Anyone else? So she asked if um, I was concerned about getting products from the continent to here. Um, oh, that was the last one. Okay, yeah, so if I was concerned about that given the political climate in America, yeah. <laughs> and also, even without that situation, it is very difficult to, to have reliable shipping. So what we currently do is we take as many orders over the course of two weeks. And so usually um, that'll be so anywhere from 20 to 50 outfits, package them all together and have them all delivered to Detroit. And then we uh, ship them out individually. So we try to do large batch to avoid as much of the those issues as we can. But if anyone has advice, that would be so great. You could take that offline. And thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs> okay. I hope you do connect. You know, if it's appropriate there. So we're going to talk about some legal stuff uh, here. There, are the PDFs of this presentation are on the website. In the interest of uh, trying to fit as much in as I can, I'm going to skip through some of the slides, but they're there for completeness. So the first thing to say, this is background information only and not legal advice. There are two reasons for that. One, uh, maybe three, but one is, uh, uh, first of all, the law changes. So anything that's here could change tomorrow. And secondly, legal things are very fact dependent. So if you look at this and say, oh, yeah, I understand it, it may not actually apply to you. But the idea is you become a better uh, understander of where the red flags are on it, OK? We're going to do it through a life cycle. We're going to look at parts of the life cycle of a business, starting at, we're going to look at intellectual property, legal entity, people, and financing. And we'll start uh, with the idea stage and pre-financing. 
And to put it in context, if you look at historically what the largest component of value of a company, this is the S&P 500 over the years. And when you look at, you take the market capitalization, that's the number of shares times the share price, and you look at what the hard assets are of the company are, the buildings and everything, that's been decreasing over time, and the intangibles have been increasing. So 84% of the value of the fortune of the S&P 500 in 2015 were these intangibles. We used to be based on land and then uh, production facilities. The intangibles are ideas, people, et cetera. One of those is IP, intellectual property. So I'm going to give you a quick overview of the different types of intellectual property. One is none. You have no protection. That's, that's simple. A trade secret, that can prevent others because they don't know how to do it. And we'll go into the details on each of these in a moment. Uh, trademark and copyright uh, enhance value, but they don't block anybody. In other words, if you, if you have Coca-Cola as a brand, that doesn't prevent someone selling a similar product under the name Pepsi. Patent cuts both ways because, as you'll see, in order to get a patent, you have to actually disclose what you're doing. So you actually empower people to do it once your uh, patent expires. And things like uh, software can go both ways. Now, if you look at duration, how long do these things last? Uh, trade secret lasts indefinitely as long as it's a secret. And patents have a definite life. If you look at the cost, it goes the other way, pretty much. Patents are probably the most expensive uh, of these. So that's the overview of what we're going to do in the next few minutes. Um, before we get into the individual details of those, let's step back and say, well, which of these do I care about? And I think you have to start with IP based on what the goals are for the company. Do you have a core technology you need to protect? What's the risk? Is the product, is there a risk of reverse engineering? If somebody looks at this, can they figure out how to do it? And once you've shown it, they can go off and be a competitor. That may suggest patents. Uh, if the lifetime of your product is very short, a lot of cycles, it may not be enough time to actually protect it. So you may not want to go that whole way for that. Um, and if you have something that's profitable over time, a long, long scale of time where you're going to make money, you want to protect it over a long period. Uh, business model also manage, uh, is a, a factor. If you're going to manufacture and sell it, you can probably keep part of that a trade secret. If you're going to license it to others, then you're going to really want to develop an IP portfolio to, to be able to sell to them. And there are other uh, bars to entry in a market, sometimes regulatory, that is FDA approval or a drug on patent uh, that's been approved is a double whammy and also economics of it. Do you have a model that is um, very efficient? You produce things better and faster than others and that's the barrier to entry. And then finally, exit strategy. And that gets back to what you want to do with the company. And as Ken went through and talked about, you know, are you want to be king or do you want to be rich? Or do you want to be a king who's rich? Um, if you have investors, you have to think about the exit strategy. So those are the high-level business things to think about as you do this. So let's sort of define it. Trade secret is something that protects, that gives you an adva unfair advantage in the market. Uh, and it's protected as long as nobody knows it. And here's where non-disclosure agreements are an important uh, part of it. When Yano comes in, he's going to talk about how he dealt with some of his trade secrets with non-disclosure agreements. That'll be on um, next Thursday. Um, if you have a secret sauce, you know, don't publicize it. Don't even put it in the plan. If people get to the point where they really think that the value proposition you have looks good and they're going to do due diligence, then you might be able to, to talk about it. Venture capitalists, by and large, will not sell non not sign non-disclosure agreement. And the reason is, you may have a good idea, but somebody else has a very similar idea. If they sign an agreement with you, and the next person comes in and they like, to, like that person better, or the business model's better, they don't want to be beholden and having violated agreements. So most of them will not sign a non-disclosure agreement. Um, trademark service mark. This is something that identifies whatever you're doing in the mind of the relevant consumer. And it could be a word, logo, even color. Uh, 
red underbody of a shoe is actually trademark. I guess they cost a lot of money. Um, and even a sound, the sound of a Harley uh, was actually trademarked. Uh, the roar of the MGM lion. Um, it's a mark under which you sell your goods or services. There's a house mark, which is the name of the company, say Lenovo, uh, or Virtual Inc. or MGM. And then there could be a product. So if I say to you uh, Tide, the detergent, you may know that that's, I think, currently owned by Procter & Gamble. But you're not associating it with P&G. You're thinking of it as a brand. So the product mark would be the name of the product. ThinkPad for a Lenovo product. Mimeo for the virtual ink uh, product that we saw on the first night. And Rocky the movie is, goes with the, the lion's roar. The rights to a trademark uh, come from actual use in commerce. And um, it used to be that you'd have to go and use it in commerce and then file for a registration, federal registration. And that could be a big problem in that you had to develop all of the mark and the, the ad copy and all of that. We now have a thing called intent to use, where you file uh, registration and say, I intend to use this mark for these goods. And once you get an intent to use application, you've got a period of time in which you actually can do it. So you can go test it in the market. Um, a trademark is also a common uh, law. It arises a common law. If you haven't registered it, you just put a TM uh, next to the, the term you're using or this, the phrase. If you have a service, you put SM for service mark. When you do register it uh, with the uh, copyright off, uh, the Patent and Trademark Office, and they grant it, you can put an R in the circle. The advantage of registration is it gives you nationwide protection uh, over anybody else if you get it registered. Whereas, you know, if you have a common law mark, you might get protected in the area where you've already uh, developed the physical area. You want to pick something fanciful, if possible, something distinctive. Apple for a computer, iPod, Mimeo. And don't really pick something that's just merely descriptive, like storage technologies. Is, what do they do? They store stuff. Uh, analog devices makes analog devices. So those are not strong marks. Um, and to see whether it's available, you can actually search at the patent office. They have a searchable database. And you look and see whether. Um, it's uh, by a particular uh, field classification. Uh, so you can have different marks in different areas. OK, any questions on trademark? OK, good. All right, copyright. It's the right to make copies. OK, <laughs> it arises from creating a work. As soon as you create a work, a copyright arises. So it's, it protects the expression of an idea it doesn't really protect the underlying idea. And the reason is, if we were to give a, um, if a copyright could cover, uh, say, Romeo and Juliet as an idea for a love triangle in literature, that means nobody else could use it. If, if the idea was saying you couldn't uh, use it. So it's really the expression. It's the words. It's the scene. It's all of that type stuff. So it makes it reasonably uh, good for music and the like, and maybe not so good for software, although it has some advantages. Uh, federal registration is a plus. Uh, in order to register it, you have to uh, deposit the thing that you're claiming. In the software area, there's a whole procedure for uh, redacting or covering up any of the you know, certain parts of the code that might be trade secrets. Uh, the duration is long. It's 70 plus years. So for most of you, that's, you know, you'll probably not be around in 70 years. Uh, and the cost to register is low. It's actually under, what did I say, $100, depending on the nature of it. Both the trademark and the copyright, these are granted by the federal government here in the US. And it protects you in the US. There are similar um, provisions in other countries. So it's a country by country type thing. So if you get a trademark uh, here, and then you go to sell something in Italy, you may find out, for example, that the Italian distributor went and trademark the same name there and uh, beat you to the punch. So if you're, depending on the nature of your uh, business, if, if branding, as in recognition of a brand is important, you'll want to think about uh, which countries you're going to be in as you 
build the company up and get there before. Now, for your venture, so that's the background. For the venture, there are two important, or one important thing, really, two important things. One is, who owns the copyright? Well, the, it's owned by the author, with only two exceptions. One is if the work is produced by an employee while uh, on doing the job. So an employee producing something that's part of the job is owned by the employer. It's also if it's a work for hire. Work for hire means it's, you're, you're not an employee, but you've been hired to produce something. And if you don't pay attention to that, the typical way you get a company going, you probably don't have employees at the beginning. People are working maybe as a consultant. You're paying some money on the side. And you don't have an actual agreement that says uh, this is a work for hire, and it's going to be owned by the company. So I had a case back in my law practice days where a client was an import-export uh, company, and they had spent a half a million dollars having an outside aid, uh, company develop an import-export tracking system for them. Half a million dollars. And then they found out that that outside contractor was selling it to other uh, import-export companies. And they came in and said, you know, we paid for it. Why, how can you sell it to others? And it turned out they did not have an agreement that said who was going to own it. So they spent a half a million dollars uh, to produce something that now could be sold to all their competitors. So the important thing there is to make sure that you uh, even with an employee, there's usually an invention and disclosure agreement for technical people. And if you've ever worked for a company as a technical person, you probably had to sign something like that. Uh, and for a work for hire, if you're the people hiring the people to work, you want to make sure you own it. Now, the flip side is if you go do something for a big company, their agreement is going to say, we own what you, what you made, which is exactly what I just told you. But if, if your business is, say, programming or developing software, you're going to develop things that you're going to reuse. So you have to go through a bit of a dance with them and explain, you know, no, you can't own the whole thing. You can own my final deliverable. I have the rights to use the components in other products. And good luck with that one. You can work it, but it takes a while um, to do it. Uh, also check if you're using uh, software, open source. Make sure you're not including open source in your in your product uh, and getting tied up in the open source licensing things. You can segment it. If you use open source, do it as a separate module. Uh, have your thing interact with it, but don't embed it directly in yours without thinking about open source. Questions as we go? OK. Oh, yeah, quick one. Yeah. So I understand the concerns as a business that you need to pay for this work and now they're using it for someone else and that sounds wrong. But then how does the agency uh, protect itself for a similar kind of product for someone else? Well, that's where you have to have an agreement. When, when, when the big company says, let's say you're programming, you know, they have a consultant services agreement and it says we own everything. And you say, no, no, you don't own everything. And you explain what it is you're actually being contracted for. And they can own the resulting full code base for what they did, but you've retained the rights to use pieces of it in other projects, that type of thing. And if you really, um, you know, if you really have some power in the situation, we had something in the network area where we were dealing with digital equipment, and they said, digital equipment, as you may have remember, if you know anything about from history, they were very proprietary. They were not open. And so uh, they wanted to own everything that was done by my client. And I said, well, that's great. It means that whatever they do for you, they're never going to do for anybody else. So you won't get the benefit of any of their advances. So what we will do is we'll give you a six-month uh, exclusive on it. But we, after that, we're free to do whatever we want with it. So it depends on your negotiating type of thing. OK, so let me move on to patents, which is the sort of the big kahuna in the IP space. This is a limited time uh, monopoly. It's federally granted uh, for anything that's new, non-obvious, and useful. And it has to be applied for. Uh, copyright exists whether or not you register it. A trademark exists whether or not you register it. 
you have certain benefits from registration, but a patent doesn't exist unless you apply for it and you've been granted it. So um, it's very much like real estate. This is a really important point. If you own a piece of real estate, the prime thing you have is the right to keep trespassers off. I can say, you can't walk on my land. Now, that doesn't mean um, that I actually can use my land, right? I mean, think about it. I might have to walk across your land to get to my land. Or maybe I'm landlocked by a bunch of people. I can keep people off of mine, but that doesn't necessarily mean I can use it. It's a right to exclude. And people think of it as the other way. It's the right to practice your invention. Well, it is, but it's a right to exclude. The claims of the patent are like a fence defining the property. And you want to make sure you have a tall fence that's strong, and that's what the key part of a patent is. Uh, the duration in the US for what's called utility patents, which are most of the patents you'd be getting, is 20 years from the date of filing. So you have 20 years. So for something like, um, you saw the material stuff uh, on, that they were talking about that took 15 to 20 years to get to market. You know, some early technologies, the patents will have expired before it actually can get to market. And just something to keep in mind as you do it. Let's dig into this a little bit more to explain sort of how it works. Suppose you invent a vessel to hold a liquid. That's something nobody ever thought about. It's novel, it's useful. And I say, wow, that's great. I have an idea, maybe it'd be easier to pick up that vessel if I have a handle. And I patent the handle. A cup with a handle on it doesn't, cannot be had because I can prohibit you from putting a handle on your vessel and you can prevent me from putting uh, the vessel on my hand, handle. The only way it happens is we cross license. Make sense? Okay. Sometimes this patent stuff gets all down in the details, but at, at the top part, it's a right to exclude. So let's go into a little bit more detail. It has to be something new, which means, and actually you have an um, obligation to cite to the patent office any prior art, it's called, uh, things that are already out there that you're aware of that um, is relevant to determining whether your idea is truly new. It has to be useful. That's usually not a problem. If you looked at some of the things get patented. Uh, it has to be patentable subject matter, and this is where a lot of turmoil happens as to whether computer algorithms are, are patentable and that keeps changing. The Supreme Court's doing all sorts of weird things today, but you have to pass that. An important part is it can't previously be sold or publicly described, um, uh, and by that I mean an enabling disclosure. If I, if I say to you, I've invented anti-gravity boots, and I don't tell you how I do it, that's not a, an enabling disclosure. Now, in the US only, you have one year from the date you either publicly disclose, or we'll talk about also whether you've held it up for sale, one year in order to get a patent application on filed. If you don't in that one year, you can't, you can't get a patent at all. So you have to be really careful about that. The rest of the world is primarily a, it doesn't work that way. So I was in Istanbul uh, as part of a program uh, mentoring some teams in a program called uh, Global Innovation Through Science and Technology. A team from um, Egypt was there, and they had a way to do um, you know, five times the throughput in a wireless network. It was great. They were all excited about it. And I asked them, have you, uh, filed, a, have you, you have a, filed a patent? And they said, oh, no, we're thinking about doing that. And I said, well, have you written a paper about it? Oh, yes, we just got published in the you know, prestigious journal or whatever. And I had to explain to them, Ugh probably the only place, depending on what that said, probably the only place in the world you're going to be able to get a patent is in the US, and that's if you get on, on the ball and file it soon. You've lost patent protection every place else in the world. And just to see his face drop. So don't make that mistake. We'll go into a little more detail. Uh, also, it has to be not obvious to the uh, one of ordinary skill in the art. Um, and we had a case out of Venture Mentoring Service where um, a professor had uh, some new technology, and um, he said, well, you know, 
if people think at it, it's sort of intuitively obvious. And so I don't think I can get a patent. And so I talked to him. I'm not a patent lawyer, but, <laughs> but I, uh, I've done a lot of patent strategy. And I, so I talked to him and his mentor. And I said, I, I'm not convinced that, that what you've done is, is obvious to people. And I'd really recommend you go talk to a patent lawyer. Uh, and they did, and they ended up starting a company, and they ended up selling it three years later for $250 million. So I didn't get any of that, but they wouldn't have started the company otherwise. Uh, in the US, we've switched to a first inventor to file system. It used to be that the first to invent would win. Today, it's a first inventor to file. And so a race to the patent office is important. And I'll explain. Uh, the use of provisional patents in a moment. But right now, I'm in the middle of a collaboration agreement between a company I've co-founded and a very large consumer products company. And their approach in the Silicon Valley and in technology, you file as soon as you can, because there may be a smart person down the street that's doing exactly the same stuff. What they do, and I've seen this happen over and over again with larger companies, they wait until they're close to launching the product into the market. And then they go figure out what they've built, and they file a patent on it. So we had one case where uh, cons another consumer products company spent 18 months researching an idea, you know, finding their customer, doing all this other stuff. And then right at the end, we were working on another project for them. They said, could you take a look at this? And it turned out a bunch of patents and applications had been filed in those 18 months. And they probably were not going to be able to carve out a protectable position because they waited until the end. And I'm in the middle of this collaboration agreement where I'm trying to explain to the big company, we've got to file sooner. And they, they don't quite get it. But people in the fast-moving industries do get it. So first inventor to file. Um, it's the, uh, what you get is the freedom to make license. OK, does your, hmm. I'm going to skip this one. We'll come back. Um, We'll skip that one, too. So prior, prior art, how do you find out what's there? Um, you got to do some. You don't have to look and find prior art. If you know about it, you have to disclose it to the examiner. Uh, but you have no obligation to search. That, that's not a really a bright thing to do, because it costs a bunch of money to get there. You really ought to know what the landscape is. Yonald's going to talk about that on uh, the last day of what he did, which was quite interesting. Um, a good place to search is the website of one of my companies called seetheforest.com. There's a free version of this. And for MIT people or people taking the class, you can get a premium version just by writing me and say, I'm working on a project. Can I get upgraded? Uh, we do patent mapping. Here is when Yonald had his first uh, patent application. Uh, this is a map of what it is. So the timeline is left to right horizontal is time. Each of the boxes is aligned in time. The left edge of the box is when the patent was issued or published. Uh, the connections between the boxes are the citation references. So remember I said, if you cite prior art, if you know prior art, you have to cite it. We connect the dots, and you can begin to see what's, what's happening. Uh, so when he got his patent, it looked like that. And here were the people that were in the backward landscape that he cited. And then several years later, people started citing him. Now, these citations, unlike citations in a paper you might do or a, a book, um, there's a legal consequence if you don't cite prior art. It can actually result in the patent, if it's granted, being invalidated because it's called fraud in the patent office. If they can show you knew about somebody else's work and you didn't cite it. And so these things mean something. It's not like I might cite my professor's seminal book in a paper I'm writing for my PhD, because if I don't, I'm kind of stupid from a political viewpoint. I mean, who knows what the actual relationship is. Here, there's some relationship. And so by looking at these maps, you can begin to see, well, who's there? What do they have? What are they doing? Maybe these are customers. Maybe these are our partners, uh, because I'm doing something that they're already spending money patenting. This is what his portfolio looked like later on. These are all his patents and showing everybody who cited him. So there's a bunch of people citing him after they got there. And then that's in 2012. By 2019, 
the number of people that cited his stuff went up dramatically. So these were new people coming in the space. Um, and so by tracking that, again, you can figure out who, who's a potential partner, maybe a funder or an acquirer. You know, one of the things to do with a startup is to figure out, why don't I build something that I know someone's going to want to acquire? Um, and so by looking at where they are and figuring it out, you might be able to do that. Uh, or it could be possibly these people are infringing. But knowing what's there is important. Anyway, you can use that for free. Let's um, just talk about the process of obtaining a patent. Um, first of all, you have to figure out what to, what to patent, when to file. You have to prepare uh, some applications. And then you have to prosecute it. Prosecute it sounds like a crime or something. But it's, it's negotiating with the patent office the claims to see if you can get a patent and get yourself a piece of property. So uh, it's, sometimes people want to patent things just because they could get a patent. It's a cool invention. I'd like to get a, you know, I have 15 patents to my name. It sounds sort of good. Uh, they're expensive, as you'll see. What you really want to do is what, what do you want to patent on? What gives you a competitive advantage? What if somebody else could do, could uh, undermine your, what your business is? What might be valuable to somebody who might acquire me? And you know, that's an important thing to do. These things have real value. We were in this collaboration I was just telling you about with the big company. We had been in negotiations, and we were into contract drafting, and there were all sorts of provisions. Well, what if you guys don't get a patent? We had a bunch of applications. There were provisions. Well, the licensing, the royalties would decrease, and this and that. And then in the middle of all this, we got a notice of allowance in the US. China and Europe. And so I was able to come back because we had filed uh, two years before. And I came back and I said, we've got three patents. All of a sudden, a whole part of the agreement disappeared and actually gave them a lot of confidence to move forward on it. So there's where you go. Um, determining where, uh, when to file. Uh, I talked about uh, disclosure also on sale bar. If you actually put something on sale or, or distribute it uh, at a trade show or something, that starts the one-year clock in the US. And it might kill you overseas. Um, and I talked about first to invent uh, is now first to file. Um, so how do you get around this? Sir? What's considered a public disclosure? Um, there is some law that says that an academic setting, maybe in a seminar, that's OK. But certainly giving a speech at a conference wouldn't be. Uh, publishing a paper if, um, would, would uh, be a public disclosure. If it's an enabling disclosure, if you don't tell how you're doing it, it's not really a disclosure. Somebody has to be able to look at it and say, I, oh, I see how I can make that. So there's a lot of detail underneath that I just want to make sure you don't rush off and do something without thinking. The, yep. Interpersonal conversations, if you're speaking to a friend or colleague and describing this idea you have, that wouldn't be considered a public disclosure? It wouldn't be a public disclosure if they had signed a non-disclosure agreement, which they may or may not have done, or if it was done in a, in a confidential setting. But you want to really be careful. On the one hand, you want to make sure you put a team together. But you know, if, you're if you're describing the enablement of how it's actually done, that you'd want to think about. The solution to that is file a provisional application. Okay? So remember, in the rest of the world, if you disclose before you file, you don't have a right to get a patent. So the US put in place what's called a provisional patent application. And these establish, you don't, you don't even have to put claims in it. I've seen a paper, somebody giving it a paper, slap a cover page on it, send it in. And that's a, that got them a filing date. Remember the first inventor to file. Um, it protects the invention for a year in a sense that you have one year to get the utility application, the full application on, um, and gives you that priority date. Uh, it's fast and cheap. It's $140 for a small entity and $70 for a micro entity. That's the filing fee. Nothing happens at the Patent and Trademark Office. It's not examined uh, at that point until you file a utility. Uh, but if, you've, if you, let's say you put something in, it says, I've been researching, and I, just, I found that fruits and vegetables are healthy, and I'm claiming fruits and vegetables. 
and in the course of the year, you file a patent app, a provisional. In the course of the year, somehow you discover that, that protein is also important. You didn't describe it in the original, so you can't get the early filing date for the protein. This is particularly good, these provisionals, if you're in, in software development uh, or something where you're iterating quickly. So in, when we were doing uh, See the Forest, developing it up, we had release cycles every four to six weeks. We'd sit down every four to six weeks before we released it and said, what did we do that we think is important? And, and we'd file a provisional application. That gives us 12 months to see whether it was really important. What did we think about doing but we didn't implement? What did we discover in the course of the last development cycle? Maybe we should file something on that. So we had a, a series of monthly, you know, almost monthly patent applications, and then we had to make a decision 12 months out whether we were going to convert. But it's a very effective way to get a, around some of these, these uh oh, I got caught kind of things. Um, what's in? A, if you, how many people? Anybody have a patent? Okay, yeah, so you know what it's like. It's basically. So why do we have patents? It's, it's, a, it's a monopoly. It's a limited time monopoly. And we have antitrust laws. So why do we have patents? What's the, what's the social policy? Yeah. It innovation. And how does it encourage innovation? Because you motivate people to discover, create new things. Then you protect them by giving them a certain period of time to commercialize it. All right. So the idea is if we don't have some way to protect it, you'll never come forward with the idea. And so we'll give you a limited time where nobody else can use that, or you can keep other people from using it. And so then we, be, we build on each other, and over time, things build. That's why when you see some of these patent maps, you'll see things explode over time as an area develops. So in order to do that, you have to describe your invention. You know, what is, what's my idea? And what's the, uh, typically it says, you know, a typical patent application will say, you know, in the world of X, there are these things that are solving this particular product. Sometimes it'll say, these are deficient in certain ways, you know, whatever. And I have this idea to do the, to attack this problem in a different way. And here's here's my disclosure of how I would do it. And then if you uh, have been able to convince the patent office that it's new and all of that stuff. Um, and you have some claims, then you have the claims describing what it is, the re invention is, it's protected. Um, so, and you also have to describe the best mode of, of practicing the invention. So if you know a really good way of doing it, you can't go and say, here's sort of a half-ass way of doing it. Because if that comes out in litigation, you, you know. Um, so you can see these things follow a pattern when we're going to talk in a few minutes about how to use lawyers effectively, if you just walk into a patent lawyer's office with your lab notebook or a digital version and say, here's my invention, you know, you're paying the lawyer by the hour to write it up. You really ought to be the one to write up the description and most of it and then have the lawyer's time drafting the claims. The claims are the important part of, of the patent. Okay, what does it cost? Um, <laughs> Anywhere from five to fifteen thousand for a full patent application. It can go higher than that. I had a situation with a co-founder who, who was calling the patent lawyer all the time without telling me, and I got a bill for thirty-five thousand dollars. <laughs> and I said, "Time out. Anything to the patent lawyer comes through me first. You know, because he didn't think he, he didn't think it was going to run up any money. And we had a discussion with the lawyer about how, what the chain of communication was going to be." and how he's going to build. Uh, it gets more expensive um, once you're in prosecution. As I say, you can't control the examiner. Uh, when the examiner gets it and starts the process, it's like a tennis match. Are you going to, is it a serve and volley point over, or is it a long, drawn-out rally? And the longer the rally is, the, the lawyer's on a, on a, usually on an hourly basis. Now, internationally, it gets really expensive. There's a study from the General Accounting Office of back in early 2000s that said if you're a small company where you don't actually have to pay as much in filing fees, the cost in 10 industrial countries to uh, obtain and maintain a patent because you have to file maintenance fees ran anywhere from $300,000 to $500,000.
one patent in 10 country, uh, countries. So they are expensive. The strategy here is to have filed a bunch of things, have them in process, and as you start to work with either a, a partner or maybe for an exit, uh, you, hopefully that happens before you have to hit the national phase here where you're starting to pay big dollars. Sir. Yeah, certainly incumbents try to do things to, they want to use, so, so they, they, they try to make it difficult for people to get, more difficult to get patents because they, people have heard of patent trolls, that concept. So there are a lot of patent, there's, the, the examination system is not very smooth and sometimes things get granted that never should be granted if they were properly examined. So there are a lot of bad patents out there and, um, you know, people have purchased those and then gone and sued, sued companies. And uh, there have been a lot of patent wars. They're called patent trolls because they, they're sort of extortion type things. So the solution there is to get a better functioning patent system. And there have been some efforts at that. But the, big, the incumbents don't want to have anyone block them. They don't want to have to pay anything. And so we get into whole sorts of policies about how that's supposed to work, which is beyond the scope of this, but I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, now, since there are expense, they are, uh, they are expensive, is, are there some strategies for startups or for smaller companies? Well, one is if you think you have a really, could get a really strong patent on your core technology, and that's something you have to look at through doing prior art searches and talking to your patent lawyer and, you know, doing, if you think you can get a really strong patent, you want to think about avoiding what's called a picket fence. Now, picket fence, remember, it's a right to exclude. So if I have this vessel to hold a liquid and you want to sort of get into that space, you could start filing and getting patents. So you could do a cap, maybe, that goes on the top, maybe an insulated sleeve, maybe the handle, maybe different things like styrofoam. Come on. <laughs> uh, and what have you done there? You've sort of, if you... It, you, you would come and you, you would patent things that would sort of interrupt all the commercially viable uses of the a vessel to hold a liquid. So how do you prevent that if you're a startup? One way is you just disclose all of that. You say, I've got a vessel to hold a liquid. You can do lots of things with it. You can put a handle on it. You can put a top on it. You can do this. You can do that. But once you've disclosed it, nobody else can then claim it. So you, you sort of clear the, think of it as a castle where you burned all the brush out in front of it so you can see the bad guys coming at you. Uh, and an example of a, of a picket fence is this one. This is, people know about the ring doorbell? That, that application in the middle is, that's actually a patent application for one of the components of a ring doorbell. And you see all this red? These are color coded. This is all sky bell has a whole bunch of patents around that. And that's an example of a map that suggests there might be a picket fence going on. And uh, we'll have to see what happens with Amazon that bought Ring for a whole bunch of money. Um, what's going to happen with that? OK, so here's some practical advice. Um, for employees, you want to get invention disclosure and assignment agreements so that you make sure you own it if you're the company. Um, for consultants, you want them to have a work for hire kind of agreement. So again, you would own the, the copyright for what they do and also any patents that might come out of it. If you can get them, you want non-disclosure agreements with third parties. You want to avoid infringement. You want to make sure that what you're building is not going to infringe someone else's pat patent. And you do that by sometimes getting a freedom to operate uh, opinion from a lawyer. If you willfully infringe uh, and you, you are found to have done so, uh, you can have treble damages plus attorney's fees. It can be very expensive. But if you have a freedom to operate opinion uh, from a law firm, uh, then you won't be willful and you won't have to lease that part of it. And also, you want to know what's there. Why spend five years developing something only to find out that somebody else claimed the space that you were looking at? 
Uh, and you want to understand the patent landscape, not only at the beginning, but continually through the process, just to make sure you understand who's popping up and what, what do they mean to you strategically. You want to preserve patent rights by filing, if you can, provisionals, so you can get an early filing date. It's cheap, it's quick. Now, if you talk to patent lawyers, they want to, don't want to go directly to, to a full, bled, uh, full agreement. But then you're getting in all that expense. You can be done very inexpensively. Just make sure you've described as broadly as possible the things you're trying to do. Uh, you want to make sure you file uh, before you do something that will disqualify you. We talked about the uh, first inventor to file and certainly before disclosing. And you want to think about avoiding a picket fence situation, if that makes sense. So that's a practical list on IP. Um, you want to streamline interactions with your attorneys. You can read that. It's in the materials. Uh, you want them spending their time writing the claims, not doing all the other stuff. You're paying expertise by the hour. And I've got a piece called Ten Commandments of How to Work Effectively with Lawyers that are part of the materials on the website. Um, I'm going to switch over a little bit into technology licensing from universities, just so you have an overview of what you're looking at, because many of you are here doing things in labs and you're thinking about leaving. Um, it used to be if the federal, gov the federal government sponsors a lot of research. And it used to be years ago that the federal government owned whatever came out of that research, the intellectual property. And it was administered out of Washington. And so it became clear that a bunch of bureaucrats in Washington really didn't understand what the, what the technologies were. And so nothing was really happening. So Bayh Dole came along in 1980 and it said, you know what, we're going to give the ownership of the work that comes out of federally sponsored research to the university. And, and we're going to make them responsible for uh, transferring that technology. And so um, that's what Bayh Dole is about. And it really helped. MIT has an ownership policy. Um, and MIT will claim ownership of a patent if it's made significant use of MIT facilities. You're using the atomic reactor. If you're using the, the um, computer systems here for just general computing, coding, that's not an issue. Um, if it's an MIT administered funds were used, um, they never assign ownership. They retain ownership, but you can get a license. And um, uh, sponsors may get a first look at it. Media Lab has been traditionally, I don't know what it is today, but it's been a mess because under the, the way the policies used to be for sponsors, they got a right to everything. So if everybody owns it, nobody sort of owns it. And I can tell you a story about doing the first uh, spin out of, M out of the Media Lab and what a mess it was to try to figure that out. Now, MIT can waive ownership under these kind of things. And you can go ask about it over at the Technology Licensing Office. Um, and they also have a unique thing that if you are, this more applies more to staff and faculty. Um, if you've come up with something on your own, there's a lot of intellectual power around this place. And let's say you came up with something totally unrelated to the research that was being funded. You could actually um, give that to MIT and have MIT patent it and try to uh, transfer it. And you get, uh, if, if they agree to do it, and then you get the royalties that come out of that. I won't go into how it's split. Now, for startups, how do you deal with all this stuff? In the old days, the technology licensing offices used to license to big companies. Because they, you know, it's like, why do you rob banks? Because that's where the money is, right? Um, but big companies really aren't very good at innovating. And so the idea was, well, we ought to be able to facilitate startups somehow. How do we do that? And one way is um, often the university will give you an option to get a license. So you come in and you say, you know, here's my, um, here's my um, idea. I want to license this stuff. It came out of the work I was doing in XYZ Lab. Here's my business plan of what I'm going to do, or plan. I'd like an option to license. Now you have an option to license from MIT. You've got a business plan. Now you go talk to investors. And so if you give me the money, I'm going to execute this plan. I'm going to ex exercise that option and we'll have all of this 
all wrapped up in a nice bow. So it gives you time to run off and do it. Um, and it can be anywhere from six months to a year. Um, otherwise, you'd run around and try to, the first question inventors would, uh, investors would ask, well, you came out of XYZ lab, uh, so like, do you have rights to this stuff? And don't think about trying to sneak it out the back door because due, dil due diligence by investors will figure that out. So you play, play the long game on this stuff. Um, here's typical licensed financial terms. You have to look at issue fees. For how much does it, do they charge you to get the license? There's maintenance fees that, you know, to maintain it. Uh, requirement for diligence, meaning you know, what are you going to do? You can't just sit on it. Uh, usually a royalty. Um, and there's reimbursement of the patent costs. And so if you have no equity, it looks something like this. This is sort of typical. And with equity, it would look something like that. Now, uh, these... These are, these are, you can get them off the website. You can take pictures here. These are about 10 years old. I haven't updated them. It's hard to, to get this. This was given to me by a, a veteran technology licensing officer about typically how it works. Now, what does it mean from equity? Typically, a university would get a single uh, percent equity, like less than 10%. And you'll see a slide. The next slide is going to show you a little bit more. And that uh, percentage would be maintained until the first round of financing that your business plan says you need. What does it mean? It means you won't get diluted in the first round. We're, we'll talk about dilution a little bit today. Charlie Tillett's going to give you a good example on financial projections night about what happens to ownership over time. And Yonald's going to tell you uh, round by round what happened in um, virtual ink. Um, then they can be diluted later, and they can participate later. Here are some examples of typical royalty percentages. Again, maybe 10 years out of date, but I don't think they're radically different, depending on the nature of the area that you're in. And um, you can look at that at your leisure on the thing from the website. OK, um, now I want to move into quickly into legal entity and some pitfalls here. Any questions? Any general questions? If people are confused, I'm happy to take specific questions afterwards, but I don't want to get into a detailed. OK, we're good? Yeah? Do we need to include some data from that machine to file the patent? Data from the machine? Yeah. Like, we have an idea. We know it's going to work. Well, you don't actually have to build it. You don't even have to know how it works as long as you can convince it it's novel. Um, but it's best to be able to, in order to convince them that it's not you know, perpetual motion, is to actually, used to, there used to be a requirement that you actually s file with the patent office a model of your machine. So they had all these cool little you know, machines and stuff. So it depends. You can get a patent on a system, a method, um, a bunch of different ways, even um, the same thing as a, as a device, uh, as a method of doing something, using the device. And you'll go into all those details with your, with your patent lawyer. What I'm trying to do is make sure you don't trip over you know, the big rocks in the way uh, so you have a chance to have a, a good discussion on, these, on your particular case. OK, um, legal form. So you're sitting here. We're doing some team building. If, if um, two or more persons get together, um, um, to do something for profit. It doesn't mean you have to make a profit. And you don't do anything else. You have what's called a general partnership. And a general partnership is, from an, um, an investment viewpoint, is a disaster because each of the partners is jointly and severally liable for any obligations. So that means somebody could sue either of you or both of you. So if you want an investor to put a bunch of money in your company, they're not going to put it into a partnership, certainly not a general partnership, because they're going to be the big fat target if anything goes wrong. So typically, you don't do that. In most cases, you'll end up, when you work through all the details, into a corporation. Now, there are things called limited liability companies. We could spend a whole hour going over those. But for most of you, it'll be a corporation. And if you require a lot of capital, it's probably going to be a Delaware corporation. And the reason for that is that the, 
the law about uh, shareholder relations and when you take money from an investor that's a shareholder is pretty well defined in Delaware. Uh, there's more case law. There's a whole court that deals with it. Massachusetts, they had a proposal to put in a corporate uh, court thing that was turned down. So now if you had a dispute in Massachusetts involving stockholders, you could, the case before you could be a dog bite case and a trespass case. And so there's no expertise in the judiciary to, to do it. So there's more certainty in Delaware, especially on some of the more sophisticated agreements. Now, the question is when to incorporate. Well, certainly, if you're serious about it, sooner rather than later. And we can go into a bunch of reasons. But the one that's most important for you is what's going to come up next. Uh, sorry, I'm going to talk about subchapter S before we get to that. So when you incorporate, you incorporate in a state. We, we have national corporations. Those are only certain types of banks. Um, and once you have a corporation, uh, then the question is, how is the corporation taxed? If you don't do anything, you're called a, a sub or you're a C corporation because you're under subchapter C of the Internal Revenue Code. And that means that the corporation, any profit in the corporation is taxed at the corporate level. And then if they pay money out to you as a shareholder, it's taxed at your level. So you're two levels of tax. Subchapter S is a, an election you can make if you qualify that says we're only going to get taxed at one level. And it sort of works. It's, um, it passes through the, the treatment for tax purposes. If you qualify, if you have fewer than 100 shareholders, you have one class of stock, and you're all either uh, permanent residents or citizens, it does not, you can't have a, uh, entity, an entity be a shareholder. You couldn't have a venture capital fund uh, be a shareholder uh, because they're an entity. Um, and so here's. Why do it? Because most startups, if you think about it, are going to lose money while you're developing product and things or trying to get up to speed. And those losses are going to pass through. And there's some rules about if you're an investor, you can't really use the losses currently. The big thing is because of the exit. If you, if you build a company up and you sell it, and in this case, normally it would be an asset sale, selling the assets. On the left, if you were a C corporation, this is sort of what the tax would look like. So $100,000, or put as many zeros at the end that you want. Corporate tax rate is 21%. So then you get 79,000. And the maximum individual rate federally is about 37%. So at the end of the day, you get 50% after tax. In a subchapter S, um, the, um, the effective tax rate turns out to be 37%, because there's no corporate level tax. Now, if um, there, the first company that spun out of the Media Lab was a company called Diva, Digital Video Applications. And the founders came in and said, well, they made desktop uh, video editing for the Macintosh computer at a time when that was a big deal. And they said, well, we're never going to be able to build a big company unless we get outside investments from venture capitalists. So we'll just be a C corporation. And I said, humor me. Let's just file the S corporation election. And we'll see what happens. They never got money from venture capitalists. They funded it through friends and family. Uh, two years later, they sold the company for, I don't know, 15 million or something. And they saved a couple million dollars in taxes just because they were smart on this part. So anyway, the general strategy I have is if you're going to be a corporation, file a subchapter S. If you take money from a, an entity that will that disqualify it, you get the benefit of the money at that point at least but preserve the options. OK. Um, now, this is the one I was going to tell you about, about why to incorporate, how to incorporate early or why incorporate early. There's a weird provision in the federal tax code called Section 83. And Section 83 says, if you receive property in connection with providing services, then you have ordinary income. That's the kind of income you'd get when you have a salary. You know, it's taxed at those high rates, not capital gains. And the amount of the ordinary income is the value of the property you got minus what you paid. OK? So why, do we, why am I going into this? Well, suppose you have an idea, and I like the idea, and I'm an investor. 
and I say, I'll give you a million dollars for half the company. Now, whether you should accept that or not, from a, that's a different discussion, but let's say you do, because it makes the math easier. And we say, now we're going to go set up the company. And I'm going to give you 50% of the shares, and you're going to be the entrepreneur. You're going to do all the work. And I get the other 50% because I'm giving you the money. You just got property called stock. What is that stock worth? I paid you a million dollars for half the company. What, what's the other half of the company worth? OK. Well, you might say, look, we only have, we, we have an idea, and an idea is a dime a dozen, right? No patents and everything. That's your idea. And I put a million in, and I own 50, we, you own 50%. So maybe it's 50% of a million, half a million. All right, we could try that. You paid how much? OK, so ordinary income of a half a million, and let's say tax is 40%. So you owe $200,000 in cash. You have that, don't you? But really, you could argue it's actually a million dollars, because why would I pay a million dollars for half the company if the other half wasn't worth it? And so it could even be twice as much. Do not fall into this trap. <laughs> and the, the reason is because we, we incorporated and we gave you stock at the same time. There was an event that valued the stock. I can't tell you how many times people would come in and say, oh, I got a term sheet. We got to set the company up. We should have done that two or three months ago. So you want to separate in time the, um, and you have to make an election, by the way. Uh, within 30 days of getting the, the stock. Um, so the, the standard thing is, if you think you're serious about this, incorporate reasonably soon. You know, there's a cost to it. But when you feel comfortable, you're there. And then it's going to take you six months or eight months or whatever, probably to raise capital anyway. And you separate the two in time. And you argue that when you got the stock, it's worth a dime a dozen, a penny a share. And you file the 83B election. With the, with the government that says, I want to claim, I want my tax hit right now. Um, it also, it actually gets worse because um, we're going to talk about vesting. Uh, vesting is, was talked a little bit last night by uh, Yoast. That is, you sort of earn your stock over time. The rule about when you measure the value of the stock, if there's vesting, you measure it when it vests. And so that makes the problem even worse. So that's one reason to file the 83B election. It says, I'll take all my hit back here at the beginning. So even if you get the stock at the beginning, you should file the 83B election at the beginning. Um, the, the point here is the red flag when you're in the situation. Think about it. Make sure you talk to somebody about it. So why doesn't stock get issued in time? Often it doesn't. And that's one of the reasons we sort of hem and haw, and then finally, bingo, here's an investor. And now we have to issue stock. And I think I figured it out a bit. Sometimes it's too busy, but mostly we're not sure who is going to get what. So let's say we look at this chart here. And this also has application to, as you're thinking about how you split up equity. The vertical axis, y-axis, is relative importance. And the horizontal axis is in time. And I have a technical entrepreneur, and I have a business entrepreneur getting together, co-founder. Where would you put the technical entrepreneur at the beginning? Where on the ver vertical axis? Hi, why would you put the technical up high? Well, because probably the stuff needs Further development, it's the technical person's idea. Um, and then you put the business person somewhat down here, because there's nothing to do with the business yet other than maybe do the planning until the technical stuff gets work. In fact, the business person might have another job and is working weekends and evenings while you're in the labs struggling 80 hours a week. And so if you look at it here, how much stock should the business person get? Mm, yeah, maybe, I don't know, 1 2 percent, 3 percent. Well, that's a good way to attract people. Now, what happens to the relative importance over time? Yeah. Business is relatively more important over time. The technology 
is still important, but is relatively less important over time. And they may cross or they may not, but recognizing that you need both to have a successful venture can inform your discussion at the beginning as to who gets what. Because if you're the technical person, you say, well, I'm not going to get it's my idea. I did all the work. I'm still working my butt off. So I, I should have all the stock. And then you wonder why you can't get a good team. Now, there are ways to protect yourself about vesting and other things to make sure everyone's pulling their own weight. The technical person could decide, uh, you know, this, this entrepreneur, I took this nuts and bolts course, and man, it seems hard. I think I'm going to just go back and get my PhD, and you know, I'm going to teach and do research. That's what I really like. And there's nothing wrong with that. And so the technical person could bug out as much as the business person getting a better opportunity. So think about that. Um, I've only got a few more minutes here. Let's see if we can, as we said in the, uh, you want to look at these things. You want to think about restrictions on stock transfers, uh, so to make sure that it stays closely held with the people that are working on it. Uh, there's a founder's memo that's in the materials. I think someone mentioned it the other night that they actually use that. Um, Charlie Tillett is going to go over uh, thinking about how to split up equity. This is part of his slides, just as a precursor. Um, and the question is, how big should the, uh, the pie be? A, a recognition that in a first round venture funded deal, uh, and Yano will show this on a pie chart, um, usually between 12 and 18% of the equity of the company is reserved for employees and maybe consultants or people that are gonna actually do the work. And that's built out uh, typically with your uh, financial projections and your headcount. Um, and so that's sort of a rough idea. It means everything, there's always a, a different case, but it's, you know, you wanna maybe hire in a CEO or you know, hire in people you can't and they're gonna want equity. Um, here's some examples. Charlie will go into it a little bit more. After a couple rounds of financing, this would not be unusual, uh, these sort of numbers. And this is a dilution table that Charlie will go over and, and Yana will walk you through in great detail. Uh, so you'll see this later on in the term. Um, there are different ways of giving out equity. Some is called restricted stock. That's when you actually get the stock itself and you're a shareholder and you have voting rights. Typical ways, because of that thing about 83B, if the, if the stock is worth $10 a share and I give you 1,000 shares, I've just given you $10,000 worth of ordinary income and all you got is paper. So at some point, getting shares outright is too expensive. So you want to get the shares out early and direct ownership. Options have a different rule for taxation. And so typically, companies will switch to options as the price gets higher because you can defer when the tax occurs. And if the thing never goes up, you never pay tax on it. And in the materials, there's some description in the slides that I'm not showing. Um, vesting, typically, uh, three, three or probably four years is typical. And you should think about vesting among founders right from the beginning and set, the, set what you want for yourselves, because your investors, when they come in, are going to want to have vesting. And if you put a reasonable thing in place, it's harder for them to come in and say, change it. Uh, typically, it's time-based. Uh, a, a classic is one-year cliff vesting. That means if you leave in the first year, you get nothing. And there, then you start vesting. You get 25% after the first year, and then either quarterly or monthly over the next three years. And then at the end of four years, you're fully vested in the stock. And there are issues about whether um, you should accelerate on changing control or an IPO, an issue to talk about. Think about forfeiture right. What if somebody leaves? Do they get to keep their vested stock? Uh, or do you get to buy it back? What if the person leaves under in violation of an agreement, like they, they took confidential information or they did something wrong? Those should be set up in your agreements. Um, and then the question of, of uh, when repurchases can happen. Now, the benefit of, of thinking this all out at the beginning is you don't know who's gonna be the person that might leave. And so it's not into what actually happened, it's, gonna be, it's about what we wanna have happen. Whereas if you wait until somebody's leaving and say, well, I should buy your stock back and we don't have an agreement, then you're in, you know, at the beginning, 
Everyone agreed this is what it's going to be, and then you let it run if, if you end up with it. A founder's memo um, describes it. The founder's memo I put together after spending uh, probably three hours with each of three teams going over the same stuff in the course of a week. And I said, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm sp spending time doing the same stuff. I got to charge them something. I, wrote a, I went home and I wrote the founder's memo and I'd give it out to people before they came in and said, read this, talk about it, come in with questions. And we'd cut it from three hours down to one. Um, I do want to talk quickly about securities law. In the US, if you offer if you offer a security to someone, that offer has to be registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission unless there's an exemption. That registration is typically the thing you call an initial public offering. It's very expensive, it takes a lot of time. You don't want to do it. <laughs> if you don't register it, then the people that buy the securities have what's called a rescission right. If it doesn't go well, they can come back and claim personally against you and against other people involved, your advisors and all that sort of stuff. So you don't want to violate the securities laws. There's an exemption in private placements saying you can uh, offer this privately to up to 35 non-accredited investors. Here's some definitions. Um, you have to provide some disclosure. The business plan itself can be the disclosure because it's talking about the business. And then typically what you do is you wrap around that the things you need to talk about. Like the, the plan isn't probably going to talk about what the current capitalization is, who owns what. It's not going to talk about risk factors. You're going to put in a section called, you know, what are the risk factors of this business? Because if you don't tell people what the risk factors are and it's a material thing that you knew about and it goes south, then you haven't fully disclosed. What you don't, and you want to probably control the numbering of it. Remember the first night I had the numbering on the front page of the virtual ink? That's an example of it. Um, and you do have to file a form with the SEC. It's pretty straightforward. Um, here's the one I want to emphasize. Don't, in the business plan, don't say we're, we're looking to raise $2 million for 10% of the company. That's an offer, right? So all of a sudden, now this business plan becomes an offering, but it doesn't have all the requisite stuff in it. And oh, by the way, except in very narrow circumstances, who, what are you to say what the valuation of the company is? That's a discussion with your investors after you've built the potential investors, right? It's sort of naive to say we're going to give up in the plan itself. Once you understand the investors, it's like a marriage. You know, Do we want to get married? What do you think about in the plan? You've got projections. You know we're going to possibly grow this big, and the market looks like this, and you build the case for what the valuation could be. Now, if you've had another a previous round, you have a, some milestones, but if you put this in here, you're you're not only sort of stupid by putting it right in the document. You've just sort of blatantly turned your business plan or pitch deck into a uh, a potential offer for securities law purposes. So don't, don't do that. And crowdfunding is relatively new, and there are a bunch of issues there. But we've come to, uh, to the end. So I'm going to, I've gone through some things. I've left some slides hidden that are actually in the full PDF. And hopefully, you've got a quick overview of the kind of trying to identify things that could trip you up, things to think about. And hopefully, it'll stay in the back of your mind as you're going through the process saying, Oh, I better go talk to somebody about that because I think there's something there. I don't have to understand it fully. I have to understand there might be a problem there. So with that, we'll conclude tonight and tomorrow, next uh, Tuesday, I guess, Bob will be back. And I forget what the other... Oh, we have negotiation, I think, on Tuesday. So have a great weekend. Uh, if you Don't forget if you're doing... If you're forming teams, to email the TAs with your team mates so we have an idea of how people are, fun, are getting together. We are encouraging you, if you're doing it for credit, to actually try to team up. If you need help teaming up, again, the TAs can help. Any, I'll take questions down here afterwards, and thank you.